Super Mario Galaxy 1 and 2. I absolutely love this series. Both games are amazing and they captured my imagination like no other games have. I'm very interested in space, and I think Mario Galaxy 1 and 2 had a role in that fascination. So of course I was going to cover this series, and what a great time to do so with Super Mario 3D All-Stars having come out recently. Although they forgot one of their biggest All-Stars, but anyway, I decided to choose this iceberg, the one created by Comet Metal. If you don't know who that is, he's an expert on both Galaxy games that has contributed a lot to the community. He also helped me to understand some of the entries in the iceberg, so shoutouts to him. Also, here's something new I want to bring to the video. Some of you thought it would be a good idea to implement a health bar system that's been used by Mishkoz and other YouTubers. I'll give it a go. Full health means I'm completely confident in what I'm explaining, and no health means that I'm just guessing and have no idea what I'm talking about. Anyway, for those who don't understand the iceberg analogy, here's a quick summary. Topics that are pretty surface level and are more known sit near the top. The deeper down the iceberg you go, the more obscure, less known, and undocumented the entries get. We'll be going through them all, starting from the very top. So are you ready? Let's take an in-depth dive into the Super Mario Galaxy 1 and 2 iceberg. Hell Valley Sky Trees. What a way to start things off. This is the name given to the ominous looking entities that can be found in Mario Galaxy 2's Shiverburn Galaxy. They can also be seen in the background of the Pool Star area in Grandmaster Galaxy, but I'll be focusing on the more widely known spot of them in Shiverburn. They can be seen standing on this cliff edge staring down at Mario. It's widely thought that there are three of them, but there is actually a fourth one and it can be seen properly at this angle. The galaxy is internally named similarly as Beyond Hell Valley. Now I know what you're thinking, Hell spawns in my Mario Galaxy game? Not quite. The Japanese to English translation may hold the key to the answer. A video by Geek Remix called Hell Valley Sky Trees Finally Explained, Nintendo Theory, link in description, points out that Jigokudani translates to Hell Valley. This place can be found in Japan. It gets its name from the snowy landscapes and geothermic hot springs of the valley. This duality of hot and cold can be found in Shiverburn Galaxy, which would explain what Hell Valley is. Now that half of the name is explained, what about the sky tree part? Well, it could be based off of the Kodama, Japanese folklore tree spirits. If you're a fan of the Neo franchise, you'll know what these little guys are. They might also be based off of these monkeys that bathe in the Jigokudeni hot springs. This could all suggest that Shiverburn Galaxy was inspired by Jigokudeni. Either way, people's imaginations have gone wild. Creepypastas and spooky theories surrounding the sky trees can be found all over the internet. And it all might be because of a translation, but also because these unrecognizable figures just stared down at you from a distance. Always watching. Rosalina's mother. She's a character that is referenced and appears during Rosalina's story time in the library of the Comet Observatory. This story is about Rosalina when she was much younger, about how she went off into space on an adventure to help a lost Luma find its mama. This story and the accompanying music always makes me choke up. It's so damn sad and innocent, especially when it's revealed that Rosalina was away from her mother too. <clears throat> Don't fret, dearest. I'm not going anywhere. I'm always watching over you, like the sun in the day and the moon in the night. It's later revealed that her mother is actually buried under a tree where they used to go for picnics. But before that, she cried about wanting her own life back with her mother, and then I cry. In the end, the Luma transforms into a comet where Rosalina and the other Lumas live to this very day. But let's rewind back to her mother. They obviously share biological similarities, and it looks like Rosalina's fashion style mimics her mother's, almost like a way to remember her. Although, there's another path we can take, specifically about who Rosalina's mother is. Peach and Rosalina are related. In the Prima Collector's Edition strategy guide for Mario Galaxy 1, it states that Rosalina was planned to be related to Peach, but the idea was scrapped. 
This is supported by Yoshiaki Koizumi, the lead director for the game, who mentioned it in an interview. Just like with the Hell Valley Sky Trees, speculations and theories ran wild, with the biggest one being that Peach is Rosalina's mother. This theory doesn't have anything to do with the game guide or the interview. She definitely looks like Peach, just a more mature one. But how would this even be possible? For those who don't know, massive spoilers for the ending of the game by the way, but the universe resets and reforms, but the cycle never repeats itself in quite the same way. How does Rosalina know this? Well, she would have had to have gone through a cycle reset herself. I mean, look at her, she's a giant space mama. This suggests that Peach would have been her mother in one universe cycle, and Rosalina can still remember that. It's an interesting thought. Her backstory could have been made when Rosalina was going to be related to Peach, but had to be changed up slightly when the idea was scrapped. MatPat also made a two-part theory where he explains some of these points, along with some biological ones. These include how Peach and Rosalina are left-handed, both have blue eyes, and have attached earlobes. But you know what else is interesting? Thinking about her dad. Who would Rosalina's dad be? Luigi. Rosalina is Luigi's daughter. Let's look to genetics. Luigi also has blue eyes, attached earlobes, and he's left-handed. He also had a telescope in Luigi's mansion. Mario didn't. This could have been his telescope. She never tells Luigi that he is her dad, but we do have something that might allude to it. A family photo of some kind. After getting 121 stars and beating the game as Luigi, you get this nice little photo. We can also see that Rosalina's brother is wearing a green hat possibly wearing his father's hat. Let's continue to focus on Luigi, but not just one, two Luigis. In Mario Galaxy 1, you can find and rescue Luigi in Ghostly Galaxy. You'll find him on the Comet Observatory afterwards, and he'll go search for a few power stars to aid you. But then, if you play the game again as Luigi, the exact same thing happens. You'll find Luigi as Luigi. He's rightfully confused at first, but he comes to terms with it. What a cursed universe. You are Mr. Gay. Um, so, this, this refers to the sparkles seen on the Super Mario Galaxy title screen. Each one of them is seen on certain letters. You can take each letter with a sparkle and it'll spell out, You are Mr. Gay. It doesn't just end here, the saga continues in the sequel, where we can see that the sparkles have been allocated to letters again. You are me I. Wait, that's, that's not right. So, let's say it backwards. Ya yeah, I'm, are you? Intentional or not, I can't wait to see where this conversation goes in the third game. That is, if it's ever made. Hidden Train in Toy Time Galaxy. In Mario Galaxy 1, hit up the first mission of Toy Time Galaxy. Come to this little area after getting the first spring mushroom power up, use the first person camera and ooh woo! A toy train underneath this block area. And this ends the first layer. It was mostly filled with surface level community driven mysteries. But now, we'll be hitting the second layer of the iceberg. So let's dive into some obscurities. Star bits are Competo. Competo is a Japanese sugar candy that comes in a variety of colors and flavors. For those who don't know, star bits are used as a collectible currency that can stun enemies, harass the locals, or be spent on feeding lumas to create new planets and galaxies. Load those lumas up with star bits and watch them explode, just like you would if you had too much sugar. They can also be used to get coins or spin chance cubes on Starship Mario. There's a very obvious similarity between these and star bits, and that's because the star bits were actually modeled after the sugar candies. Fun fact, these are put in the Ministry of Defense's emergency food ration tins and the Imperial Army's military combat ration. They're added in as a nice pick-me-up and they aid in the calorie content, aid in the creation of saliva, and to reduce stress because of how nice and colorful they look. They can also be used in candy boxes called bonbonnières for marriages and childbirth celebrations. Just as a side note, these little candies also appear in The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword as gratitude crystals, and you will also have seen them in Spirited Away. Automated GameStop message. So, GameStop sent out an automated phone message to everyone that pre-ordered Super Mario Galaxy. Charles Martinet, the voice actor for Mario, was hired to voice this message. He introduces himself and then puts on his Mario voice. As Mario, he explains that he's at GameStop and they told him that the buyer pre-ordered his newest and greatest game, Super Mario Galaxy. Woohoo! 
He continues to explain that the game will be ready to collect tomorrow at the GameStop where the pre-order was made. I'll play some of the audio, so take a listen. I'm a to wait for you to see me flying around in my Bumblebee outfit. I'm out in space, trying to rescue the princess. Ah, she makes my heart go bada bing, bada boom, bada ba. Oh, and you know what else? GameStop will let you bring in your all the games to trade in for credit. Yeah, credit to help you buy a new copy of Super Mario Galaxy! I'll also link the full YouTube video from Random Vids 2 in the description. Other people have posted this too, but this one was the one that I found the easiest to listen to. Being a little kid and getting a message from Mario, THE Mario, about your pre-order of his game would have been magical. What a way to make someone's day. See, GameStop can do good things sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Pokeball Planet in Boy Base Galaxy. It's known as the Aquatic Dome, but has been dubbed as the Pokeball Planet. It's pretty clear to see why people named it this. The resemblance to a Pokeball is uncanny, so it's probably a reference to the Pokemon series. It even shoots out a red laser similar to an actual Pokeball. On this Pokeball Planet, Mario has to spin on a screw to open it up in order to get the star inside. It's like he's becoming a Pokemon, returning to his ball, or he's going inside the Pokeball to collect a Pokemon. Pretty creative. Rosalina's original design. This was first seen in the Prima strategy guide. Rosalina was originally designed much differently to her finalized look. She used to have more of a princess look to her with the beehive hairstyle, a tiara, and she wore a gown. There are also some small differences like these power star earrings, what looks to be a power star necklace, and her white gloves. Compare this to Rosalina's more motherly space look and it's clear to see that she went through a big design change. Starman Fortress. Here comes some more Prima strategy guide talk. This is an unused level developed and then scrapped for Mario Galaxy 1. It's been noted to have been very memorable for the development team because it was their earliest drawings for anything in the game. This is what made them realize that yes, we're making Super Mario Galaxy. From the concept art, we can see a big fancy looking tower, a pulley system for a crane, a cannon, a waterfall, a lake, trees, grasslands, and a platform that looks to be powered by electricity. There's also a few lights, planets or asteroids, a moon, some stars, a spaceship, and boss crab, which is very resemblant of Megaleg. Aspects from the stage have also been noted to be in the game. Parts of the fortress can be found in the code for the game as well, so it can be somewhat pieced back together without the cannon, waterfalls, or programmed boss. Swanky Box has a pretty rad video covering this where he plays on the level and explores it. If you want to check it out, the link for the video will be in the description. Pikmin ship in Ghostly Galaxy and Space Junk Galaxy. In Ghostly Galaxy, we can spot a spaceship in the distance using the first person camera option. And in Space Junk Galaxy, you can walk around on it before using the pool stars. But there's a third place you can spot the ship, on the unused Starman fort level, right up there. This ship is thought to be referencing either the SS Dolphin from Pikmin 1 or the Hokotate ship from Pikmin 2. The Hokotate can also be found in Pikmin 3, but it's destroyed. I would say it looks more like the Hokotate ship because of the similar window, coloring, and ship style. Super Mario Galaxy More The second Galaxy game in the franchise was originally going to be called Super Mario Galaxy More, which was dubbed Super Mario Galaxy 1.5. It wasn't even going to be a new game, it was planned to be an updated version of Mario Galaxy 1, but was later decided to be turned into a sequel. This was because at first, elements such as Yoshi, a planet shaped like a head, and many more things that were scrapped from the first game were to be implemented. But over time, more ideas were added to the point where the game just became the sequel we all know and love. Fun fact, Takeshi Hayakawa, the lead programmer for Mario Galaxy 2, created a development tool that allowed any of the staff members to design and create stages without the need for programmers. Many of those levels made are in the final game too. Coconuts turning into watermelons. This is pretty simple. If you get 9,999 star bits in either games, all the coconuts found throughout the game turn into watermelons. Pretty neat. Super Mario 128. 128 was a codename for two projects that were developed by Nintendo in 1997 and 2000. 64 plus 64 is 128, so it was first going to be a sequel for Super Mario 64, known as Super Mario 64 2, for the 64 disk drive. Now, if you don't know what the 64DD is, I'll summarize it quickly. It's a magnetic disk drive peripheral made as an add-on that attaches into the extension port underneath the Nintendo 64. This allowed for an expanded and rewritable 
portable data storage, a real-time clock for persistent game world design, think Animal Crossing or Pokemon. Going back on topic, the Mario 64 sequel was cancelled, and the name Super Mario 128 wouldn't resurface until Nintendo Space World Convention in 2000. This name was given to a GameCube tech demo that included 128 Marios chilling on a circular board, hence the 128 in the name. It was done to show off the power of the GameCube. Mario and the Marios were able to walk around, move and throw boxes, and they could roll each other around. It was kinda goofy, and it also looks like it was using some sort of physics engine. There's also this pizza thing that happens, followed by the damn screams of 128 Italians. But most importantly, we have this. Terraforming and spherical landmasses. Are you starting to see where this is going? The demo was developed by Koizumi, the director of Mario Galaxy. Super Mario Sunshine came out in 2002, and one year later in 2003, Koizumi joined Nintendo's Entertainment Analysis and Development Division. In the division, Koizumi's team began their work on developing spherical platforms to showcase to Shigeru Miyamoto, a game designer, producer, and director at Nintendo. This is where this has all been leading to. This spherical platform development paved the way for Super Mario Galaxy, in addition to that, gameplay and other influences from the 128 tech demo assisted in its creation. It doesn't just stop there. The Pikmin from the Pikmin series, the physics from Metroid Prime, and the sphere walking gravity in Mario Galaxy and Twilight Princess all derived in some way from the 128 tech demo. So in a way, because of 128, we have been able to play some of the best games made by Nintendo, and that's pretty awesome. Continuing on with the discussions of pre-release ideas, footage, and gameplay, E3 Beta Gameplay. The Mario Galaxy Beta was held during the E3 of 2006. There's a lot of things here we don't see in the final game. I'll be going over the most noteworthy stuff I can find. Right off the bat, shoutouts to GameCube Cafe, you will be missed. The starting screen's logo is a bit different to the final version. The first planet the player visits is Star World, which did not make it into the final game, but was found in the game's code. There are bells on an archway here that can be interacted with using the Wiimote. They spawn 20 music notes for the player to collect. Collecting all 20 would spawn a 1-up mushroom. Star bits were called Star Shards, and if you couldn't tell already, the Star Cursor was a bit different as well. Toads used to have exclamation marks over their heads whenever they wanted to talk to you. Octumbers used to hover around as well. UI-wise, Mario's live count says Mario above his face icon, which is strange because it's pretty obvious it's Mario. He also used to have 8 total hit points like in Mario 64. It's even color-coded that way, and Mario could collect coins by spinning. Getting Star bits using the Wii Remote makes collecting them very convenient, so I'm surprised they took this coin collecting feature out. Music wise, it seems to be the same for the most part, except it amps up while using certain warp stars. Which I don't think is in the final game. The videos I watched were by Christina Dev and IGN. Obviously, the links to the videos will be in the description. Christina Dev's video only has sound coming out of the left audio channel, so I'll also add a link to a video by Mario where the audio is fixed. I'd recommend watching them if you're into pre-release video game content. If you notice anything major I may have missed about the E3 beta, or if I got something wrong, I'd be curious to know. Anyway, moving on. Blue House in Deep Dark Galaxy. This refers to a house with a blue roof. In this galaxy, you can shoot yourself to a planet called Scale Down Relay Planet. This place has a few houses and Goombas residing on it. It looks like a scaled down version of the first planet in Gateway Galaxy, the opening level after the intro. It even gets the same space background. So destroy the locals and head to the previously mentioned house with the blue roof. If you crouch and walk into the house's doorway, you can clip inside of it. Using the first person view, you can see some of the interior on the inside and you can see the coins that appear if you shrink the planet. You can also see a lot of the level from this location. Once you're finished inside the house, you can easily just walk out of it and continue on with your day. And that about does that. Cut content, random knowledge, and a few references made up the majority of this layer. And now, we'll be moving on to the next one, so let's go deeper into space. Okay, so to start this layer off, I'm gonna hand it over to my friend Big Marsh. He's a great content creator that's also dabbling into iceberg content. He has an interest in the Mario Galaxy series too, so take it away, Marsh. Hey, thanks for having me. 
Galaxy has always been interesting to me, and the fact it takes place in space really adds that sense of mystery and almost slight eeriness. I've always wanted to learn more, so let's start with Ruby-shaped star bit cluster in Rolling Gizmo Galaxy. This trial galaxy is the player roll a star ball to the end of the course to pop it open. At the starting area, if you walk through the zigzag path to the upright bridge, you can find a starboard formation shaped like a blue ruby from The Legend of Zelda. It's underneath where the bridge falls, and it's hard to view unless you have some height and look downwards, but there it is, just chillin'. NVIDIA Shield Port Officially, Super Mario Galaxy was released on the Wii, was a download on the Wii U eShop, and recently has become available on the Switch. But there's one release of the game that isn't very well known at all the NVIDIA Shield release in China. The game was playable on the Shield in the region of China since 2018 and ran a 1080p resolution and 60fps, and it runs on Android. Due to the Shield controller not having motion controls, all of them were mapped to the buttons. The right analog stick is used as the on-screen pointer, and the right trigger is used to grab and pull stars and to confirm menu choices. It reminds me of a kind of controller scheme you'd use on a dolphin emulator. A video by Direct Feed Games compares the two, and the only difference I can see is the text language and lighting, with the NVIDIA version having much darker lighting. It's pretty crazy that China, out of all places, got an official 1080p 60fps version of the game before the rest of the world. But who was the company to put the game on the shield? Super Mario Galaxy IQ The Chinese video game company IQ was founded in 2002 to localize and distribute Nintendo consoles and games in mainland China under the IQ brand. This is how Mario Galaxy was able to get localized on the Shield through the IQ, which is a 100% Nintendo-owned subsidiary. Oh, but it goes deeper. Games distributed in China by IQ, such as Super Mario 64 and the Mario Kart series, Mario Calculator, and New Super Mario Bros, were released on the IQ branded consoles. For the most part, they just slapped the IQ brand in front of the handheld console's name. As an example, the IQ DS. But the Nintendo 64 was called the IQ Player, IQ has localized a few other games in the NVIDIA Shield, the Wii, the 3DS, and the Nintendo Switch. It's pretty crazy that Nintendo has to do this just to have some of their games sold in China. Super Mario Galaxy 2's E3 trailer. This came out in 2009 and has a lot of unreleased game content within it. Shoutouts to the homies at the cutting room floor for collecting all this. The biggest talking point here is Starship Mario. It used to look like nightmare fuel. It also used to have star bits and a 1-up mushroom on it. And the Yoshi Star Galaxy was just completely different. Just take a look, it's unbelievable. Interestingly, in Bowser Jr's Fearsome Fleet, a cutscene where two airships come out of wormholes didn't make it into the final game. Instead, it happens during gameplay. Just as a side note, the lack of sound effects in this trailer really puts me off. There's no footstep sounds, and Yoshi makes the same uncomfortable grunt sound effect when he's doing stuff. There's also some acid that doesn't seem to belong to any galaxy. We have this spherical bottle with liquid that Mario is chilling on. It might be an asteroid, but it's hard to tell. Here's a stone slide, it's similar to the one found in the Tall Trunk Galaxy, but this time, made of stone. There's also some asteroids and a green planet seen in the trailer, but it's unknown where this is. And finally, just, just as a small side note, <gasps> Spin Dig, Flip Swap, Puzzle Blank, Hightail Falls, Cosmic Cove, Honey Bloom, Cloud, D, Court, Freezy Flag, Supermassive, Space Storm, Boo Moon, and Belt, Battle Belt Galaxy all had some minor changes made to them before the final release. Jeez, that was a mouthful. That covers most of it, if not all, of the tree trailer. And that's about does it for all I have to say. Thanks again so much to Sunflower for having me, but now I'm handing the mic back to him. Feeding hungry loomers makes them commit suicide. Um, yeah, so when you feed a Luma its desired amount of star bits or coins, it'll transform into a new galaxy or planet. Transform is just a fancy word for die, because Lumas have a lot in common with regular stars. Stars explode and die when they exhaust their nuclear fuel or when they accumulate too much matter. The latter applies to the hungry Lumas because you feed them matter to the point where they're not able to take any more. So when this happens, it'll explode its outer layer into space, causing a supernova, leaving its hot and exposed core to cool in space. The aftermath of a star's death can create a new star or a new planet over eons. In Mario Galaxy, that all happens pretty much instantly. They want you to do this to them, they want to explode and create new galaxies and planets. In a way, Mario is assisting in their so-called suicides. The same thing also applies to Lumilies, the Lumas who will transform into mushrooms or dice. Comet Tico is unique though. When you feed it 20 star bits, it'll place a prankster comet in a galaxy. But Tico won't die in the process, and it can be 
repeated. Here's an even bigger question, what are these black holes we see all over the games? Are they the remains of a Luma that failed its transformation, or are they just regular dead stars? I mean, Lumas are quoted saying that they can transform into regular stars and comets too. It's a lot to think about, but obviously, this is in a kid's game, so there's no dark undertones to it. You're just there to help the Lumas fulfill their wishes to transform, that's their destiny. You also get more of the game to play, or you get some assistance for doing this. There are also regular Lumas that'll transform into things without needing to be fed, and that further confirms that this is what they want to do. Just on a side note, supernovas create the most beautiful nebulas and imagery seen in space. My favourite is easily the Cat's Eye Nebula. Perfection. Super Mario Galaxy in Nintendo Power 1991. If only we had 27 fingers, written by Jimmy Peterford of Glen Cove, New York. His letter was featured in a 1991 Nintendo Power magazine. It states that his fantasy console would be a complex 512-bit system that could display 27,876,992 colors. He also wants it to be able to play any game from any system before it, and there would also be a miniature band inside the console that knew how to play any song. It would come with 6 27 button controllers and would cost $259.95. All of that was some very wishful thinking, but that's not the main focus. This is. The game he wanted the system to come out with on launch was Super Mario Galaxy, aka Super Mario Bros 24. But hang on, this is 1991. Super Mario Galaxy didn't come out until 2007. Coincidence? Probably. But what if Jimmy, Jimmy over here, went from 2007 and time traveled to 1991 just to be, uh, a bit cheeky and talk about Mario Galaxy and this whack-ass console in Nintendo Power. No? Anyway, I think this letter's a bit off-putting. I mean, there's just a random name drop of Galaxy in it. He just decided to add the word Galaxy to the end of Super Mario and then doesn't even describe what the game would be like? Also, his predictions on the Ultimate Console weren't far off of what the Wii was actually capable of. Kinda. So the Wii came with a 512 megabyte built-in flash memory, had the virtual console to play old games, had a band playing music at E3 2006 that had the sound coming out of Wiimote speakers, and it all seems pretty coincidental, but it's fun linking stuff like this together. The fountain is the bathroom in Japan. The fountain is one of six domes in Super Mario Galaxy. In the Japanese version of the game, it means bathroom. Basurumu. But wait, there's more. According to MarioWiki.com, the name of the fountain is bathroom in every other language except for this Spanish and obviously English. It's interesting, there's more bathroom here than there is fountain. There's a few gaps in the walls for fresh water to flow in, an area for water to flow out, a circular area to bathe in, wall tiling, and a relaxing atmosphere. It kind of reminds me of a Japanese bathhouse. I'm surprised that this dome isn't called the bathroom worldwide. Storybook Rosalina vs Baby Rosalina. You know, at first, I thought this was asking who would win in a fight, but no, I get it. It's all about the differences between them. Rosalina's backstory was explained during her story time and it fleshed out her character. Meanwhile, Baby Rosalina, she races cars and is on doctor duty. There's nothing else known about her other than she's a baby Rosalina. And you'd think that Rosalina would have told the Loomers about her racing career and doctor career as an infant. The inconsistencies between these two versions of Rosalina are massive. Plus, storybook Rosalina has hints of a light red color in her hair. So how could she go from blonde as a baby, to light red hair as a child, and then back to blonde as an adult? <laughs> At this point, I don't even think baby Rosalina is the same as Mario Galaxy Rosalina. She's a demon. Sign behind the door in Good Egg Galaxy. In this galaxy, a house can be found and approached. A read icon prompt will appear when Mario is near the door. Click the A button and a text box will appear saying, Gone. For a long time. Need to get in? Use the pipe on the other side. In case you didn't know, the read prompt is reserved for signs, but there aren't any visible signs at the door. If you're able to turn the camera to clip it through the house, we can see a sign on the other side of the door staring down Mario. The developers created this cheeky illusion of interacting with the door when you really aren't. 
If you enter the house from the chimney or the other side like the sign said, you're taken into this weird gravity manipulated room in some sort of void. It's a lot bigger than the actual house itself. You can touch this question coin to spawn music notes that'll play the underground theme from Super Mario Bros. You can also shoot some star bits at these to get some coins. It's a really strange and mysterious room with no context. Did something happen in this room? Is there something here that would make the owner want to go away for a long time? It's unknown. Unused beta songs. Both games have unused songs from their beta builds and just in general. They all sound like they would have been used for level themes, boss fights, and just miscellaneous stuff. Shoutouts to the homies at the cutting room floor again. I'll leave a link to the songs on their site in the description. I'll also finish off this entry by playing some of the songs I like the most. It's hard to tell which of these songs were actually beta songs, but they were in the game at some point, and they're all unused. Super Mario Galaxy 1's Lonely Atmosphere. It begins, right after the events of the Star Festival, after all of the havoc. This moment right here. This zoom out begins Mario Galaxy's Lonely Atmosphere. This theme of loneliness is scattered throughout the game. Space is infinitely large, infinitely expansive, and this is Mario, an extremely small part of the universe. Stop and take a deep breath in, and just relax for a few seconds to take in the enormous horizon in front of you. The camera zooms back in, and now you have to chase three rabbits. Has it hit yet? You're one of the few small creatures on this small planet. The accompanying music assists in this lonely feeling. It's not quite action-packed like it is in other Mario games. After catching all of the rabbits, Mario is introduced to Rosalina, and then is tasked with finding and taking back the first Grand Star. It's used as fuel to power the core of the Comet Observatory, the hub world of the game, the source of the lonely atmosphere. During story time in the library, Rosalina recounts her loneliness, while helping Aluma find its mama, she mourns over the loss of her family, her mama, truly feeling alone, even with her Luma friends. The Comet Observatory was created through a mutual bond of loneliness felt between Rosalina and the first Luma she encountered. This feeling of loneliness accompanied with sadness can be seen on Rosalina's face, and especially in her eyes. She'll never have her loving mama back nor will she ever be able to see her father or brother ever again. Truly, a loneliness amongst the crowd. However, she's content with it all. She has accepted it. Without hesitation, she embraced motherhood and foster care. She's a mama for these loomers, so they won't have to feel the pain that she's felt. This is my family now, and I will stay with them until they're ready to leave the nest. And when they do leave, I'll see them off with a smile, because that's what makes a mother happiest. We can see this lonely atmosphere seep into the rest of the game, all across its universe. Warping across the cosmos to other galaxies to obtain more stars is exciting and gets you pumped. But then, this can happen. You feel small, alone on this planet inhabited by a few small creatures. Looking off into the horizon shows that there's even more out there, and you haven't even scratched the surface of it all. As said before, the music helps to solidify this feeling. Even when the music is upbeat or fast, the feeling of loneliness in an infinitely large universe cannot be shaken. That is what Mario Galaxy aims to make you feel. It's an immensely powerful feeling, amplified by certain events and levels. It can also take a back seat while other themes and spectacles need to take the spotlight. But no matter where you are in the game, no matter what you're doing, its beauty will always be there, like a mama watching over her children. That concludes this layer of the iceberg, a layer full of obscure knowledge with an emotional ending. The finale is on the horizon, so let's continue.
original soundtracks being MIDI. Yep, that's right, the original soundtracks for both games are MIDI's. Comet Metal, the guy that made the iceberg, sent me a link to download them. So here are some comparisons between the MIDI's versus the orchestrated music. If I'm being honest, I'm pretty unclear on the background knowledge of why these midis were made, but if I had to guess, they could have been created as placeholders before the orchestrated versions of the songs were made, but that's just my guess. Super Mario Galaxy 2 is Super Mario Galaxy 1 after the universe reset. The universe reset in Mario Galaxy 1 happens after defeating Bowser. Mario is taken to a... Uh... Uh, here, and then Bowser, Peach, and Mario wind up back at Peach's castle. How they got there is unknown, but everyone seems to be having a good time, good and bad guys alike. Obviously, Rosalina remembers what happened in the previous cycle. Mario, Peach, and Bowser may also remember, but it's unknown if anyone else does. If we look to the skies, we can see the Comet Observatory. This means that the universe reset changed up the events of the Star Festival that Bowser crashed. Remember, but the cycle never repeats itself in quite the same way. Mario welcomes the new galaxies, and if you collect 120 stars as Mario, you can see that the Lumas are alive in the new universe with Rosalina after the credits. Mario Galaxy 2 starts off on a new festival. Peach invites Mario to eat her cake as they watch the shooting stars. So these shooting stars are mentioned, but nothing about a big blue comet. Already we can see some universe reset differences, and there's plenty more. On his way to the castle, Mario finds a lost baby Luma who he befriends and grants him the spin ability. Bowser gets huge from eating Grand Stars and attacks the castle and steals Peach. Mario sets off for the center of the universe with his newfound friends, where Bowser is creating his empire. But the most important piece of the puzzle is Rosalina. At the end of the game, when you defeat Bowser and rescue Peach and the final Grand Star, Rosalina appears. She thanks you for your efforts and for keeping the baby Luma safe. But she also says something that ties everything together. Oh, yes. This is not some sort of accident. She is referring to the events of Mario Galaxy 1. And that is why Mario Galaxy 2 is Mario Galaxy 1 after the universe reset. To be a little more specific, it's an altered version of it, just in another cycle. Duplicate torch on the observatory. So I looked around the Comet Observatory for about 20 minutes, and then I finally found it. It sticks out like a sore thumb, honestly, it's just so much brighter than all the other torches. Jasper RLZ on Twitter pointed this out by showing that there are two torch objects stacked on top of each other. Something like this really isn't that obvious, unless you're looking directly at it. So I'm not surprised that no one in the development team picked up on this. Unused Galaxy Selection Models Back to the cutting room floor, there are a total of 6 removed Galaxy Selection Models in Mario Galaxy 1. Unfortunately, there aren't any model files to show, but it's noted that 4 of them are galaxies that could be accessed by launch stars in the Comet Observatory. These are Sweet Sweet Galaxy, Bubble Blast Galaxy, Rolling Gizmo Galaxy, and Drip Drop Galaxy. These galaxies are still playable. See, Sweet Sweet Galaxy is accessed after feeding a Hungry Luma 400 star bits and Drip Drop Galaxy is accessible after feeding a Hungry Luma 600 star bits, and Bubble Blast Galaxy and Rolling Gizmo Galaxy are part of the three trial galaxies. The last two selection models are for unknown galaxies. They don't have official names, so all we have to go off of is Mini Cooper Jr. Driver Galaxy and Mini Trileg LV2 Galaxy. Donkey Kong Jungle Beat Leftover Model Files Numerous models and their animations from Donkey Kong Jungle Beat have been found in Mario Galaxy 1's game model folder. Just like with the last entry, these can be found on the cutting room floor. We have Backy, Bee, Black Mist Creature, Coco Pig, Crest Model, Flame Gun, Neck Dragon, Note Fairy, Pig Pogo, Rush Airfish, Spring Flower, Throw Kiki, and Windmouth. Here's some quick facts about some specific models. The black mist creature has no head, and the flame gun has been noted to work, kind of. Its animations work, but there's no fire being shot out of its mouth. 
It can be safe to assume that the developers had plans for some of these models and were using others for testing. There is actually one model from Jungle Beat that made it into Galaxy, the Bonanda Lion. However, there are special shaders that make it appear pink instead of its regular orange in the game. It's also called a creeper in the Mario Galaxy game files. Kinda weird. They remind me a lot of Agapanthuses. We got a lot of them where I live and they look really nice. Rosalina's father in the French version of Rosalina's storybook. In the French version of Mario Galaxy 1, Rosalina's storybook has different lines on this page in the French version. I got Claire to translate the French for me. There are slight differences between people's translations that I've seen online because of word preferences, but they all follow the same premise. Closing her eyes, the girl remembered her little planet shrouded in soft light. Mais j'aimerais bien, une fois tous les cent ans, retourner sur ma planète bleue. Et m'assoupir sur les genoux de mon papa en caressant cette moustache qui fiait sa fierté. That's really beautiful, but it's very strange to see that this one page was kept in the French version only. It gives us a little bit of insight into who Rosalina's father was. This also has major implications on the whole Luigi is Rosalina's father theory too, but let's not focus on that. The man Rosalina describes sounds like a person who is proud and has lived his fullest life and now has settled down with his family, working and enjoying family time when he can. Blue Shelled Coopers a file called obj underscore arg0 determines the color of a Koopa shell in Mario Galaxy 1. If ID is changed to a 3, the Koopa would get a blue shell, even though there aren't any blue shelled Koopas in the game. Cosmic Mario does use a blue shell to swim faster in the Sea Slide Galaxy race, so that's the closest we got to a blue shelled Koopa. I wonder how a blue shell could have been used. I imagine that it would have worked like it does in Mario Kart, where it seeks out whoever is in first place and crashes into them, so that would suggest that it would be used in a cosmic race. But if we want to be more general, it could have been used to seek out a foe with the highest health in a certain vicinity, or maybe it could have been used in a boss fight. That would have been fun. Haley's Comet in the Kitchen Dome window. This comet comes to our solar system periodically every 75 years or so. It was last spotted and photographed by NASA in 1986. This means that its next appearance will be in either 2061 or 2062. We can see this comet in Mario Galaxy 1 through the Kitchen Dome window. There's some other cosmic light partially covering its tail, but there it is in all of its glory. Realistic Bug Models Back to the cutting room floor, there's a set of realistic bugs and their larval forms that have no similarities to any other models found in the game. They look a bit vicious too, which definitely clashes with the whole aesthetic of Mario Galaxy. We have Lava, Big Lava, Small Fly, Big Fly, and my favorite, Big Big Fly. Some of them have been noted to have animations, so what would these bugs have been used for? Alien infections in space are a popular concept. Just look at a few popular video games from the last 20 years or so. We could have gotten a galaxy or planet riddled with an alien infection that might have rotted a planet or infected other creatures. That's kind of worrying to think about in the context of Mario Galaxy. You know, a lighthearted game made for kids. Nvidia Shield Port using Waifu 2X to upscale textures. Waifu 2X is an image scaling and noise reduction program for art drawn in an anime style and for other types of photos too. This entry suggests that Nvidia scaled up the Mario Galaxy textures using Waifu 2X. I know the upscaler has a haha <laughs> funny name, but from what I've seen, it actually does a really good job. I don't exactly know how much validity this entry has either. Comet Metal has claimed that this is the case on Twitter, and anytime I think I've found something explaining it, the page doesn't exist anymore. So this is either some massive troll or some really good insider knowledge. Tokyo Patrol Error Mario Galaxy 2 has a lot of unused text files. A lot of these are unused dialogue, which is where Tokyo Patrol Error stems from. These are all MSBT files containing video game text and information on how it's displayed. From the basics on what I can understand, this is an error message that should appear when you do a sequence break or if you're somewhere you're not supposed to be. The game doesn't do that in the final release. Maybe there was no need to display this error anymore, even if you did do a sequence break or got to a place that you're not supposed to be. Either way, the messages never show up in the game. 2007 website. I was looking through the Wayback Machine for any websites with the Archive 2007 site. 
I got a lot of results from the search, but no 2007 website. However, supermariogalaxy.org was the first result, and it led me to an invalid URL. The .org intrigued me, so I Google searched the URL and found a link to the Nintendo.fandom page on Super Mario Galaxy. So why go to this site? Because they have external links to websites. Clicking on the official Japanese site link takes us here. I can't read what's written here, but I noticed the copyright 2007 Nintendo text at the bottom of the page. This was promising, so I copied the URL and pasted it into the Wayback Machine. This has to be it. It's not too different from the version of the site from the Mario.fandom page, the October 11th snapshot is less complete than the November 1st snapshot. The game released on November 1st, 2007, so that makes sense. You wouldn't want to show off everything the game has to offer before the game was even launched. This has to be the 2007 website this entry is referencing. And hey, if it isn't, it's still technically a 2007 website. However, there's not too much of a difference between the 2007 and 2020 version of the website. All I've really been able to notice is this giant Wii U banner and a link for Mario Galaxy. Galaxy 2. Back to the 2007 version, there are links that take you to pages on the site with general info, images, galaxies, controls, power-ups, and PC wallpapers. For some reason, the wallpapers can only be found and downloaded on the November 23rd and beyond snapshots. That's just a summary of the site. It's a neat little piece of history. There's more detail to explore, but I'm not sure how to get there normally through www.nintendo.co.jp. Finding an archive link like I did may be the only way, and that'll be in the description if you want to check it out. Space Junk Galaxy's Unused Cosmic Clone Race Data This exists under the name Ghost Data Stardust Galaxy. It's a strange name, sure, but what's stranger is that a cosmic comet can never actually orbit the galaxy. There's also no version for Luigi to race, which means that the level was cut out of the game before finalizing Luigi's cosmic races. Here's a video by Aurum called Super Mario Galaxy Unused Space Junk Cosmic Race. In the video, Aurum loaded and recorded this level. In the description of the video, it says that some tweaks had to be made to some of the settings to get it to work. The speedy comet was replaced too. The starting cutscene doesn't look like it was finished because of how it transitions to the actual race. Even so, the race looks awesome and using the blue stars to race the cosmic clone isn't seen in any other races. This unique element in the race would have made it stand out from the rest of them. I'm sure this race was removed for a good reason though. I can think of a few. The blue pool stars can give Mario a large amount of speed if used properly, so the race might have been too easy, even though Aurum loses. The developers might not have considered this level much of a race, or the cosmic clone getting in the way too much could have been another reason for the level's removal. Super Mario Galaxy 2 takes place in 20XX. There's a game called 20XX inspired by Mega Man X that plays like a road-like action platform game. There's a sequel called 30XX coming in 2021, but I don't think this is what the entry was referring to. I've been completing my first playthrough of Persona 5, so my head went to this. The day change. The 20XX. It's an unknown year in the 21st century. Mario Galaxy 2 is thought to take place in this century. I have searched far and wide for answers on this, but none have appeared. So it's theory time. There are two ways I thought about looking at this. The first one is that Mario Galaxy 2 takes place in an alternate version of our 21st century. As you could tell, there's a major difference between our world and the game. Alternatively, we can view it as Mario Galaxy 2's events happening in real life. I think aliens would have to come to Earth before this can even happen. Oh, and a proper means for space travel would also be needed. So when does this game take place in the 21st century? Who knows, but get ready for an out of this world experience. Now this brings us to the final entry. Blue Grass Galaxy. Let's finish off with a bang. Blue Grass isn't blue grass, it's a genre of music. It originated from 1940s America and derives its name from the band, Bill Monroe and the Blue Grass Boys. The music's roots stem from the traditional English, Scottish, and Irish ballads and dance tunes, and in African-American blues and jazz. The tunes traditionally consist of acoustic instruments, and it sounds funky. We're listening to the music right now, and you'll recognize this song from the Mario Galaxy 2 level, Puzzle Plank Galaxy. This is what we're dealing with, but where does the galaxy part of Bluegrass Galaxy come from? It gets tricky here, it's a galaxy that was thought to have once existed. However, it seems as though it's an over-interpretation by those believing it was 
was once real. Looking at this discussion between people on MarioWiki.com, the user CoinCollector asked the question of if it ever existed in the first place. CoinCollector explains that if no one can answer the question, it'll be considered fanon created information. And this means that unnecessary information on the topic should be removed. However, CoinCollector states that the stage looks like some sort of planet seen in Sky Station Galaxy, and that it could have been a beta planet for that galaxy. User SK Mario Man remembers never seeing any planets in the backgrounds of the E3 trailer, but recalls music for the galaxy. User Hiccup questions this by disproving SK Mario Man's recollection of Bluegrass Galaxy's music. The only music played in the trailer is the main theme, nothing else. Now it's gonna get juicier from here. Moving on from there, we have a discussion post by Pikmin1254. They give the reason behind why the Puzzle Plank Galaxy song is called Puzzle Plank Bluegrass. It's because of the genre of music the song is a part of. Quote, People are making too big of a deal over the name Bluegrass. The user Kupalmia chimes in with a Wikipedia article on the Bluegrass genre, and then the user suggests calling the galaxy Unknow Galaxy or Galaxy 25. I'm pretty sure they meant Unknown Galaxy. This is how this saga ends. A discussion over on the cutting room floor buries the mystery in the ground. Holy Roman Emperor Tatan started a discussion about the beta assets in the E3 trailer. Usopedian replied stating that Mario Wiki isn't trustworthy, pointing out some of their hilarious speculations. And there it is again. Quote, Bluegrass Galaxy, someone wrote a song title in the soundtrack and didn't realize bluegrass is a music genre. An oversight by fans. This has been what echoes throughout the discussions of users. The Bluegrass Galaxy mystery is over, and it's been over for more than 10 years. And just like this mystery, this iceberg is over. Cue the outro. This has been the Super Mario Galaxy 1 and 2 Iceberg Conquered. <laughs> Thank you all for watching the video. These games, especially Galaxy 1, mean so much to me. This video just felt really good to make. There were just so many interesting facts and theories all throughout it. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Where do you rank yourself on the iceberg? Comment it down below. I will definitely be making more iceberg content in the future. Here are some that I've been looking to cover. Shoutouts again to Big Marsh for covering some of the entries. I really enjoyed his Animal Crossing iceberg and his streams are a good time. I also made an appearance in his Super Mario Sunshine iceberg video and it was fantastic, link in the description. He's a really awesome guy and it was great to work with him so definitely check out his channel if you're interested. Give him a big hello and tell him I sent you. Thanks again to Comet Metal for helping me research and figure out some of the entries I talked about. I really appreciated that. Now before you all head out, I have something I'd like to say. I've gotten a lot of suggestions from you all on certain icebergs to cover. Thanks for reaching out and asking. As you can tell, these videos take a lot of time to make. So as a way to branch out and experiment with my content, I'll be planning on making a few videos that cover certain entries on an iceberg. That way, I can cover a suggested iceberg in a really specific way. I also want to do a game review and some other secret videos that I'm brainstorming. As said before, this will all be experimental. I just want to try new things out. As cheesy as it sounds, I have a passion for editing. So I just want to branch out and see what else I can create. Let me know what you all think about that. Thanks again for the tremendous support of my videos. Subscribe and leave a like if you enjoy the content. Check out my socials, links in the description. And with all of that being said, I'll see you in the next cycle.